Great things are done when men and mountains meet. That is a quote by William Blake. And uh, specifically, it reminded me of our next guest, uh, our second guest on the Sons of Men podcast, uh, James. And I'm going to introduce James in the same manner as I did the first guest, which is the man that I know, uh, not the things that he does with his career. Uh, so, James, first of all, welcome. Uh, thank you for coming on. And uh, thank you for reaching out. Thanks for having me. Well, I don't know if you remember <laughs> when we met. I think it, so. It, it, it's, uh, it's almost exactly 10 years ago. Oh, wow. Yeah. So we met at a dinner through your employer in November of 2014. And that was at a time when I had been working on my comic book series. And there was some crossover between what I was doing and what you were doing. And we met through a dinner and we've just stayed in touch since then. Uh, James is an incredible creative and a very kind person. He's a person that shares his heart. And I don't know, we've, I think we've stayed in touch for that reason. And it's always one of those things where even if it's been a year or two, we reconnect and we can get right into it. And I think we're going to do that again today. So yeah, thanks for coming. Yeah. On. Yeah. Thanks for having me back. Well, I mean, not back, but you know, it's good to see you again, man. Yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> And I think it's cool that you're doing this podcast all about, you know, masculinity and the mm. challenges therein. Um, I think it's, it is a conversation that really needs to happen right now. Yeah, well, it's, yeah, I, I could see many conversations happening around it. And I wasn't happy with a lot of it. And I think it's because we're too focused on um, a very specific manifestation, you know, uh, we went, you know, I would say in the 2000s, we went far in one way, which is self-care and self-help. And let's get in touch with our emotions, which is great, but maybe we went too far. And now we're going in the other direction, which is let's just get fit and go out in the woods and be men. And I just, I'm worried that we didn't learn any lessons from the previous generation. And, and I want to talk about that. And I think you, James, will have uh, I would say incredible experience and insight into that, uh, not just as a creative, but in the life that you've lived. So, uh, what's well, I, ho I hope so. I mean, like, I I do think that like there's a we're in a really weird place with questions of masculinity right now um, because I do think that there's so much that's toxic. You got sort of like the whatever, like the the men's rights kind of led fed a lot of people into sort of that who is it like Andrew Tate or whatever, like all these guys who are like legit criminal sexual predators and just like spouting this sort of toxic alpha bro BS. Um, and, but I feel like that's really speaking to a need that a lot of young men have. I mean, honestly, men of all ages, but especially young yeah. men where like, there's no, uh, there's no sense of what to be. And also I feel like there's a real deep sense of shame that like we, we ended up with this backlash because I feel like, you know, for a long time, uh, one could argue most of uh, human history, like men were not held accountable really for the way that, uh, you know, women were treated, the way a lot of people were treated in society. And then I feel like accountability finally started to show up um, and that was good. But I feel like now there are a lot of men who feel like their choice is either between uh, shame, which, you know, I'm not saying shame can't be deserved and people can't sit with it or whatnot, but like that question of shame or embracing these people who say, you don't have to be ashamed of anything. Like mm -hmm. you're, you're great all the time. Like let's lean into that, which is also like a huge problem. Yeah. And so I think trying to find those role models Right. Which, which is why, and I think people are desperate for them, which is why not just you see like the people going to the gross folks, um, like the alt right, whatever. Um, but also, I think you see people really, you know, Keanu Reeves or, you know, uh, like Mr. Rogers or whatever. Like, I think people do find these folks to sort of put on a pedestal because we're so desperate for what does it mean to be a good man? What does it even mean to be a man? Like I know for most of my life, I've been kind of uncomfortable with that term, not because 
of my gender identity. Like I feel very male, but just because man has all these implications and I was always kind of like, Oh, I don't know. I'm a, I'm a guy, I'm a dude, you know? Uh, mm. And so I think, I think there's a lot of questions around this right now. Yeah. I, I've felt that myself for a long time. I think in particular mentorship is something that has been lost. I, I see it in the creative industry, but I also just see it in general in life. There's, a dismissal of wisdom um, from, you know, people who have lived a whole life. And yeah, I, I think it's just time to dial in and get some different perspectives on how we feel as men and what are those qualities that can help answer some of those, I guess, gaps in knowledge or what people are feeling. It's interesting you say Keanu Reeves, but there's something admirable about his quiet nature. He's a celebrity, but he's quiet and he, and he is charitable and he does it quietly. He never brings attention to it. It's other people who do. So I think those kinds of people are, they are admirable and we need more men like that. And if we have good qualities, this idea of accountability, well, it, it's not so necessary because we're treating people properly, right? We change the way that we behave and that, should have a knock-on effect, especially if there's good mentorship. My wife and I talk often about this this idea of looking back, and I do see value in it, but there's something that people fundamentally miss, which is this idea of men. When I think about my, my grandparents, for instance, it was a very traditional household. You know, grandma stayed at home, did the cooking, did the cleaning, managed the kids, and then Grandpa was out in the field working, you know, 16 hours a day. But the big difference was that when they came back together, those roles, they served each other. Grandma served grandpa because he was out working hard in the field. And then he would come back and take care of the children and, and help clean up. And they were, they were serving each other. And I think people are missing that, that you want to have those traditional roles. There's this misunderstanding that it was very delineated by by gender and by the the role list of what they had to do when in actuality it was a true service of of the partner and that, i think that's the danger that we're missing of i want to get back to those times okay yeah but you have to do the work as well that is required for that to work right right well and it's funny like you know there's a way to think of that as like gender roles and whatnot but there's also a way like my friend uh, like her and her husband always refer to this as uh, gains from trade, where it's, you know, in their relationship or in a relationship, you can do things where one partner is mm. better at X or hates X less or whatever. And so they do it so the other person doesn't have to and vice versa. And like by sharing your burdens, by splitting them according to uh, preference or how good you are at it or whatever, like, you're able to mm. make life better for both of you, but it's not, uh, it's not a requirement. It's a thing that should be making both of your lives better. And if whatever your job split, your relationship roles are, aren't making both people's lives yeah, better, no, then that's, they're that's, wrong. That's a great point. And I, yeah, I, I, what I want to do is encourage more men to have those conversations with their partner. And because yeah, it's, maybe there's a lot of just accepting the status quo without really understanding why you're doing it that way. And as relationships evolve and you get older, those conversations become incredibly important because I've talked about previously resentment. Uh, resentment is a, is a, is a pretty um, terrible poison that if you let it manifest, it can lead to all kinds of other problems. But uh, let's, I want to, I've known you for a long time, but I don't think we've actually ever really talked about your life growing up. Would you be, we want to talk about that just for a minute to get a foundation sure, and context yeah, absolutely. for maybe the perspectives that you have today. Where did you grow up and, and what was your family life like? So I'm from uh, a suburb of Seattle um, and I grew up, you know, mother, father, I got a little brother who's four years younger than me. Um, both my parents were super engaged in raising me, you know, like I think, uh, they were both, they both worked full time. Um, and so it's interesting, like my dad was uh, a construction worker and eventually a general contractor. 
And then my mom was a, uh, she originally worked in uh, juvenile corrections as like a social worker slash person running the place. Um, and then moved on to run a, uh, a mental hospital for children. So she ran the state mental hospital for, you know, when you have a schizophrenic eight year old, like she was the one taking care of it. So she did hard friggin' jobs. Um, and it was interesting because she actually like, uh, you know, my dad barely went to college, like only did a little bit and she had a master's degree and was like actually somewhat famous for being sort of one of the early people promoting the idea like uh, that sex offenders, especially juvenile sex offenders, were often themselves abused. So like in addition to punishment, you needed to treat and help these people. Um, and so, uh, you know, that was really one of her passions and the thing that she was uh, sort of, I didn't realize quite how <laughs> like famous she was until we were like, they were moving out of uh, their house when I was in college. And I found an issue of like life magazine that had interviewed her about this. And I was like, Oh, you're kind of a big deal. <laughs> but um, she was very humble, but just like worked long hours at the, these soul crushing jobs because mm -hmm. she just wanted to help people and help kids specifically. Um, and it was interesting because like, she came from a really amazing family that was super tight, which is sort of the family that I consider my family. And then my dad came from a really, you know, broken, abusive, like old school logging family where, you know, like kind of everybody was messed up. Um, and so he was very traditional masculine, you know, like work on cars, had, you know, construction, the military, all these things. Um, but uh, and also had had like a pretty abusive childhood, but he was really an amazing father, mm -hmm. like having come out of that was like really dedicated to not being that sort of person for us. Um, but it was really interesting to see like they're they were both great parents. But with my mom, it was much more this sort of high minded academic like she came from a household that was very loving and, you know, uh and and just a wonderful place and so she was able to build on that with all this education to create a very reasonable like there was never a rule when i was a child that couldn't be uh changed <laughs> if you could argue it well enough like you know you would bring the issue before the court and be like you know mother i do not think that i deserve bedtime because i always right. get my school worked done, you know whatever and she'd be like okay fine you don't have a bedtime um and i think my dad was always <laughs> a little bit running to catch up just like what what? Why are, why are the kids negotiating? Like, you know, um, but so yeah, so like I had a good childhood. Um, I was definitely a nerd. Like I had, uh, I, I was a nerd and also because both my parents worked full time, um, more than full time. My mom had like a three hour commute every day. Um, but I spent a lot of time alone and a lot of time reading. Um, and so that, really sort of shaped my personality um, as well as I was really somebody who crossed uh, the gender lines in terms of my friendships. Like I was always, uh, I was always friends with as many girls as I was guys. You know, I really um, felt comfortable among, uh, among, I want to say women, but girls. Um, and of course I was also a very early bloomer. So from about second grade, I was like, <laughs> I'm going to get myself a girlfriend. And that took, you know, another seven years, whatever. Um, I also, I should mention, um, I'm also a queer man, but I didn't realize that until I was uh, right. in my twenties. So that like some things make sense in retrospect, but at the time that was not a concept in my brain. I was just like, I'm as comfortable hmm. with girls as I am with guys. Like I like, I like what, everybody. You said that your, your dad was, you know, kind of raised in a tough home and, but he was still a great father. What, yeah. What in your early years, and we can talk a bit about that transition into being a younger man. What kind of qualities do you think that he instilled in you that you, you feel definitively come from him? You know, it's funny. Um, I feel like as a kid, I didn't feel like I had anything in common with my with my dad because like my mom was the one who was very social and talked all the time. Um, and like that was that was me. Like she and I really clicked in together. 
Um, whereas my dad was much more uh, like he was quieter. He was more stoic. He really liked working on machines, you know, like he wanted mm. to be out in the garage rebuilding a car. You know, that was kind of his way of relaxing and he could be social, but, um, but I just felt like I didn't, uh, I didn't have a lot in common with him. And then, of course there would always be on the weekends. You like, right. He worked construction. So you always at, at a certain age, it was like, I need to hide or else dad's going to put me to work, like unloading that trailer, you know, that kind of thing. If I want to read my book. Um, he was also like, you know, he was a pretty functional alcoholic for my entire childhood, but like mm. was definitely an alcoholic. Um, and like, I don't know. I think that it was only once I got older that I started to see some more myself in him. And really once I started uh, dealing with some challenges in my life um, where I realized, and we'll, we'll get into this, but like uh, I'm the caregiver for my wife who's profoundly disabled. Um, and it was once I hit that where I started to understand that like, oh, there can be times in your life where things get really hard and you feel terrible and the work needs to get done anyway. So you just shove it down and you keep going. And like when I was younger, I was always kind of like, why do you know why, especially to men, like not talk about their feelings? Like, you know, why is everybody so bottled up? And then like I hit those hard times in my, you know, especially in like my 30s and went, oh, this is why. Because like the world doesn't care if you're shattered inside. You still got to get shit mm -hmm. done. Um, and at that point I started to be like, oh, I think that was a message that like my dad had really internalized. And I think he was somebody who just always pushed through. Um, and especially in like the last decade as like, so my mom recently passed. Um, but before that she'd been in extreme decline for like five, six years. And he and I really bonded in ways because he, I, I was sort of, the person he knew who had dealt or a person he knew who had dealt with the similar thing of caring for a partner while they are in a really rough spot. Um, and so I think, uh, we really came to understand each other then, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, I've always had great respect for him, but I think there was a lot of time where we sort of just didn't understand each other. Like I'm yeah. very artistic, you know, doing all those things. And he was always very proud of that, but, uh, was much more a just yeah. you work, you build the thing. Like that's, that's really interesting. That was his James. life. I totally relate to that with my own father. And I actually love how you said the relationship developed because it's not about the things you do. It's about the life experiences. And I, I, that's something I really want people to think about. Those experiences, we can share those even if we don't share common interests it's the things we go through the suffering or the, the trials we can, we can rally around those things. And that that's very much like me and my own father. I was also the artsy music weirdo <laughs> and my dad very yeah. much in the realm of, like you described, he was a farmer. He uh, very mechanical, but also he was, he was very theological as well. Um, and I, you know, as a teenager, mm. I wasn't into that at all. So we passed like ships in the night all the time. And then same as you, I went through some struggles and I had questions about marriage. I, I have talked before about being married before my current partner. And over that, all of a sudden, dad opened up to me in a new way. And, and I saw him less as dad, but more as a man who's gone through it, you know? And so I think that's right. pretty common. And it's exciting when we can put aside the the identifiers a little bit. I am a writer. I am this. I am that. And and kind of get to that second layer. So I think that's yeah. a great example. Well, I think one thing that's really interesting about sort of my take on masculinity um, or like how it developed was the family that I come from. You know, I talk about my mom being a real, you know, like hard charging sort of uh, glass ceiling breaker. Um, you know, she really was doing a lot of stuff at a time when, you know, she she would tell the story of like, you know, 
being a young professional woman and going to buy like uh, a BMW because she was like, I'm going to buy this like BMW coupe or whatever in the 80s and them not wanting to uh, like give her a lease on this car without a man present, you know, and like that kind of thing that just infuriated her. Um, But like so she also like all of her sisters were the same sort of like real, uh, you know, people who nobody uh <laughs> nobody in that family deferred to anybody else <laughs> like everybody was like a uh, a real hard charger and like that was awesome because i grew up in a family where my dad and my mom were both incredibly strong-willed incredibly passionate incredibly hard workers um and they were sort of two unstoppable forces that like met in the middle and propped the propped each other up. Like I think of them almost mm. like a cathedral arch, right? Where oh. like the weight of all those stones is holding it together because they're just pushed right up against each other. And they had this they both had this tremendous respect for each other. Like they both loved what the other person could do. Um and found real joy and like, oh yeah, my partner's better at that than I am. Um but also, you know, they ne- they never they never belittled each other. There was never any sort of like power dynamic because they both had 100% of the power all the time. And so uh, growing up, the idea of like, I remember when I was a kid, like, you know, the, the idea in society of like, oh, a strong woman or whatever became this sort of like cultural narrative. And for me, it didn't make any sense because I'd never known any woman that wasn't strong, right? Like, or that didn't have equal power in her relationship or whatever. Um, and so... I think in the same way that I grew up uh, like entirely without religion, like I think I grew up uh, with a lot less uh, cultural stereotypes around what it means to be male, what it means to be female, because uh, my parents just didn't go in for it, even though my dad is the most quintessential like dad figure mm. you can imagine. What um, Seeing that, that partnership, and like you said, they each support each other. I think that is one of the most crucial that you can celebrate the successes of others, especially in a partnership or have the wisdom to recognize your partner's talents or skills that excel even above you. It's If you can do that, yeah. man, it just unlocks this whole new mystery of getting to know each other. And you you saw that in your parents. How did that inform particularly we can transition into something that that's on your heart. And I really want to get into, which was you were married and your partner became sick. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, first off, I would just say like, I take so much pride in my wife, like from the beginning, like I have always loved like all the things (laughs) that she's better at than I am. Right. Like, because it's it's such a joy to have a, like to be able to learn from your partner to be, and also like, even just from a purely ego perspective, like acknowledging that your partner is awesome and you somehow like ended up with them. Like, how is that not an ego boost? Right. Like, you know, so like there's, there's nothing but good when you can revel in all the ways your partner is excellent. Um, Like I've never, I've never once felt threatened by like my wife's uh, you know, incredible abilities. You know, she was, uh, she's very math and computer brained in some ways, but also is an incredibly talented artist and also was really a jock when I met her, you know, she had, when I met her, she, it was not that long after she'd hiked the Pacific crest trail. So she'd spent like five months in the woods walking from Mexico to Canada. And I was just like, like that sort of stuff where it's just like, Oh, you just are fearless. Yeah. Like, that's amazing. Um, And so, uh, you know, we connect in all these great ways. Um, But yeah, so uh, when we'd been together not that long, my wife uh, first got sick with what we eventually learned was um, sometimes called ME-CFS, but uh, chronic fatigue syndrome, which has a huge range of, like, there can be people who have that and are exhausted all the time, but able to live relatively normal lives. And then there are people for whom... uh, I, one doctor described it to, um, a similar experience to being a late stage AIDS patient in terms of quality of life. Like there are at its worst people end up on feeding tubes, you know, that kind of thing. And like 
fortunately we're not quite that bad but like uh my wife slowly lost ground and sometimes rapidly lost ground and so eventually she ended up in a wheelchair and then for the last seven years um she's been almost entirely bedridden so she's uh you know she's able to do a few things for herself um but for the most part like like I have to do all the cooking, all the cleaning, any sort of household thing. Like she obviously can't work. Um, you know, there are elements of dressing, getting dressed that I have to help her with, you know, help her, you know, shower, all those sorts of things. Um, and so it is really like a pretty profound caregiving role that, uh, the, the grand irony in some ways is that, um, like I had, so I used to be the, um, creative director for a role-playing game called Starfinder, um, and you know, it's totally a dream job. And I had just decided that I wanted to step away from that in order to write novels full time. Cause I'm also, I write, uh, nowadays I write queer young adult romance novels, but, uh, I wanted to write full time and I, she was like, you know what? Follow your dream. Like I make good money. Like I work in tech, like I'll support you. It'll be great. And I was like, okay, yeah, let's do this. Um, so I quit my job had one blissful month where I did exactly that. Um, and then her health crashed and she ended up in bed and she's been there ever since. So I went sort of overnight from being, you know, I mean, somebody who had to do a lot more help in general, but also was sort of like had the blessed artist lifestyle of doing whatever I want. And then suddenly it was like, oh, I need to figure out how to balance that against like caretaking where I'm doing not just everything our household needs, but a lot of things that you never think about uh, in terms of just like, I need to really help her do everything. Um, and of course it was a huge, you know, hard emotional time for both of us. And especially for her, like she really had to wrestle with a lot of loss of sense of self, um, which I think people don't realize when you go through that sort of thing where you're no longer able to do most of the things that, make you you because like it's not even just that like she's physically disabled but like the insidious thing about chronic fatigue syndrome is that if you use up too much energy you don't recover and your health can get worse sometimes permanently and there's a time delay so like she always has to be really careful to like limit her energy expenditure uh or else a few days later she might suddenly just lose a bunch of ground all her symptoms gets worth being Mm -hmm terrible pain um and so like at this point like she's so limited where even just interacting with people is too much energy like watching tv is too much energy right like you know she hasn't been able to even like watch tv in probably the last year and like she and i really have to limit our interactions where like she gets like three 20 minute sessions of socializing and the rest of the time she has to just sort of lie silently and either meditate or listen to audiobooks. Like it's mm. really a horrifying, like it, it's like being in solitary confinement for her and she's been there for seven years. So it's a, uh, it is a God awful condition that I wish more people knew about because actually like millions of people around the world have this thing, but it's tends to get overlooked because they, the patients don't have the uh, capacity right. to advocate for themselves. Right. Um, but yeah, so uh, obviously it was a big thing for me where <laughs> I often say um, like about this transition where it's like, I had to, uh, grow up more than I ever had any intention to, you know, (laughs) like, it's like, I, what is that? What does that mean? This experience has like, it's made me a better person. And like, I think we all wish that it hadn't because like, it made me really sort of realize, uh, my priorities, um, like, and what, like to spend more time focused on what really matters. Um, but also like to to find the sort of internal fortitude to just keep going when things get really hard. Cause I, I would say that like for most of my life, I've had a pretty charmed life. Like I, you know, came from a good household with enough money and a lot of love. And then like, you know, I came straight out of college and 
like started working in creative industries. Like, you know, I get, I get to start working on, you know, Dungeons and Dragons when I was 20. Like, you know, I really have only ever had jobs that were satisfying at some level, even when they were hard, they were satisfying. Um, and you know, I've gotten to have all these incredible experiences and whatnot. Uh, and it was only really with this where it was like, Oh, now I know what grief is like. Now I know what, like, you know, for a long time, I would always say like, oh, God, I can't even really understand what it would mean to be depressed because I've always been so bouncy uh, as a person. Like, you know, I get sad and then I'm back up an hour later. Um, and you don't necessarily realize if you're like that until you're faced with something that is very bad and is not getting better. Um, and having that grind for years where you have to just sit mm. with pain um, and like the fact that like, here's this person you love, uh, who is going through so much and you can do nothing to help them. It is like one of the most profound forms of suffering. Um, like I think, uh, and of course it's still nothing compared to what she's going through, but it's still huge to feel so utterly helpless. Um, and it's actually, so there's, uh, when I talk about things that make me understand my dad. Um, so one really big event in my childhood and a story I don't really tell is um, 9-11, like when, uh, when the towers got hit. Um, I remember like, you know, my dad woke me up and like I, you know, watched TV with him and like saw what was going on. And then I went out driving around with friends, trying to find some place to donate blood because I wanted to do something. But I remember that night, my dad uh, had just kind of disappeared. Um, and like my mom didn't know where he was, like, you know, wasn't answering his cell phone. And so like, turns out he had gone out and just gotten, you know, blackout drunk um, at a bar. And I remember I found him on the side of the road, like walking home. And was just so I'd never seen him just mm. blotto before. Um, and I remember like I put, stopped the car and was like, dad, dad, you know, get in. And I guess he'd been like hassled by some cops earlier. So he kind of turned around and was like, what? And was just like yelling before he realized that it was me. And so like he got in the car, just wasted. I drove him home. And I remember just being so disturbed because I was uh, 18, 17. Um, just like, here's this invincible, you know, superhero figure, you know, and everybody like, there's that old thing about like dads or superheroes, but like my dad had always been someone where he was like incredibly physically strong. There was incredibly competent. Like there was nothing he couldn't handle, right? Like, you know, if the boat broke down, he would take apart the motor right there and then fix it back up. And like, like I just always felt perfectly safe with him because he could handle anything. And that was the moment I remember as a, even as a kid, I was like, Oh, this is like a pivotal, pivotal moment where I'm realizing that like my dad mm. can be broken. Um, and when we talked about it the next day, like he was very apologetic the next day for, and actually that was what one of the big things that convinced him to finally get sober. Um, you know, it was a long, it was a long wow. period, but that was the thing that like, was kind of rock bottom for him after, you know, being an alcoholic since he was 14 or something. Um, but what I, what he kind of said and what I realized is like the thing that broke him about nine 11 was realizing that he would never truly be able to keep his family safe. Like that there were like, it just, it reinforced this idea that like the world is a dangerous place and you, you can do everything you, you possibly can and you still cannot prevent these sort of disasters and it was that idea the idea of not being able to protect the ones you love that broke him that was the thing that the strong man couldn't handle and like i sort of understood that at the time but like having to stand by and watch margot go my wife go through what she's gone through like really helped me understand like oh I see how that could break a person like to, to be powerless to do anything to help those you love is just a huge wow. weight. 
That's, um, that's incredible. Thank you for sharing that. That's, yeah, that's, that's an intense, I mean, that must have been an incredible revelation, that connection between that moment and then seeing it in yourself. Well, yeah. Can you, can you talk a little bit about what the, I guess those early days, what that was like? Well, I mean, so, you know, it's, it's something that crept up on us, um, where, you know, she, there were many years where she just had to sort of slowly phase out what she was able to do, you know, stop playing sports, then stop hiking, then stop, you know, going for walks, et cetera. Um, I think it was really the morning. I remember very clearly the morning, uh, her wheelchair first arrived that I really like broke. Cause like I put it together in the morning and I remember going to work and, uh, coming out of like there was some meeting where we were arguing about, you know, again, I worked at a game company. We were arguing about like dragons. Um, and there was some, you know, like bitter, bitter debate about you know, whatever the draconic life cycle or something. And I remember going into my boss's, uh, my boss's office afterwards. And like, I just turned to him and I was like, <laughs> I actually was basically like, you guys need to get it the fuck together because there's a wheelchair in the middle of my living room and I don't give a shit yeah. about any of this. Like, and like he, you know, and I think I probably then burst into tears and he was like a good friend, very supportive. But, um, but I do think in some ways, actually, it gave me perspective on my creative work. Like I was able to step back from getting as emotionally involved. Like I still loved the work we were doing, but I was able to keep in mind, like there's, like this ultimately is not a big deal. This is not worth getting yeah. all anxious and tied in a knot over because like, here's a real problem. Let me like, I, I, every day I can see what is an actual problem. This is all just fun and games, like literally. Um, but, uh, yeah, no, it's, and so it's been very hard, but also like there is a deep joy in being able to be of service. Um, and that's not a thing that I had ever, like, I think I was like, I was always nice, but I think I was fairly self-absorbed for most of my life as I think, yeah, you know, most, are. most people are, um, like, you know, I, I liked being there for my friends and I've always been somebody who's very emotionally supportive, but I, and, you know, I would absolutely always help people move, but I wasn't necessarily, I'd never been in a role. Like we don't have kids. I'd never been of hmm. daily service to somebody and to really put somebody else first. Um, and one thing that's really, uh, I mean, a thing that helps a lot is that like my wife and she, you know, might object to this. Um, but like, I feel like she is a fundamentally good person. Like she's just, there's not, uh, a mean bone in her body. Like she just like truly, thinks the best of everybody wants the best for everybody is just kind and generous. And like, uh, and I know like I put her up on a pedestal a little bit and she doesn't always like that, but I do think it's true that like, she is a great person. And I know it's true because like so many people in our life in our lives have been like, man, it's horrible for this to happen to every, to anybody. But if anybody doesn't deserve it, it's Mario, right? You know, it's like this idea that we all are like, yeah, I mean, like, I'm basically good, but like, I'm not great, you know, uh, but she's really wonderful. Um, and so, like, it makes it a lot easier to sacrifice because she's also, she does a really good job of um, always making me feel appreciated. Um, you know, it's one of those things where like, I, and I say this sometimes, like, it's so much easier to be a caregiver when, you know, every morning when I bring her breakfast, she says thank you and, like, means it. And, like, that's – it would be so easy when you're that miserable to stop doing that, to just take things for granted. And, like, she never takes me for granted, and it's amazing. But, um, but I do think, like, there is a uh, – there is a clarity and peace of mind – that can come from being like, okay, this is the most important thing in my life. Like, cause on any given day, like I'm a very anxious person by nature. Like, you know, if I'm, if I'm writing my next book, I think that maybe I should be out 
riding my bike. And if I'm riding my bike, I think that maybe I should be like hanging out with my friends or whatever. You know, there's always something else that maybe I should be doing. Uh, but like when Margot needs me and I'm doing something that helps her, like those voices go away because I've, yeah, it's clarity. Right. And I remember, I remember that happening one time where like things got really bad and I had to take her to the hospital kind of in the middle of the night. Um, and I remember like both being, you know, scared and upset, but also having this sense of peace and being like, what is, what is going on there? And realizing it's because like, like all the voices in my head have gone quiet. Like, you know, this is a crisis. I know exactly what I need to be doing and what I need to be doing is whatever it takes to help Margot that uh obviously that's not a situation that i want to experience but like when i'm in it there is something really beautiful to uh to just knowing I mean, you've your been purpose. doing this for a number of years now how do you because you're still a human being how do you fight resentment or <clears throat> a voice i'm sure comes up saying why did i why is this my life I deserve better. How, how do you, how do you battle that? How do, how do you, cause I mean, we all struggle with that, which is to me is pride, but how do you deal with that voice? Um, I mean, first off, I'm lucky that I have like, I've both assembled and been sort of, uh, brought into a, like a really amazing community of friends, many of whom are very local. Like, you know, we, um, but both my wife and I are very into like intentional community. We always lived with a bunch of roommates and now uh, we probably have 50, 50 friends within walking distance. Like it's really, well, maybe, maybe 30 within real walking distance, <laughs> but like, uh, so I have a big community and I absolutely lean on all of them for sort of emotional support. And sometimes like, sometimes they can really come out for logistical support as well. Um, uh, and certainly like when needed, but I mean, yeah, it is hard not to get depressed and not to feel like, God, I like, I, you know, I should have, it should be different, you know? Um, but I also, I don't know. I mean, I'm very, it like, it helps that I never resent Margot because she's so obviously both an innocent in this situation and like she remains just so pleasant like it would be so easy for somebody in her situation to be so bitter and like obviously she's very sad and has all these issues but like she is always so kind to me and like you know I was ta I was talking the other day with a friend who was saying like you know like talking about how relationships uh you know you lose the new relationship energy over time and like does anybody really f still feel the spark in a long-term relationship? And I'm like, honestly, Margo and I have been together 17 years and like, yeah, she makes me feel loved like every day. Like she's so good at that. Um, and even though we only get sometimes, you know, a few minutes a day to talk, like she still manages to make me feel like loved and appreciated. And so it, like, that's a real gift. I think a lot of people who are caregivers, especially for caregivers of people in chronic pain, like, uh, don't get that same level of appreciation. Yeah. Right. Yeah, like, I think it's, you bring up a really good point and I want to talk about this in the future is I talk a lot about the traits that we as men should have servitude, love, putting other people first. But it is also really important that you find yourself in a situation where, that behavior, you're, you're, it's a reciprocal. And I don't want it ever to come across right. that I'm saying serve at the cost of yourself. Um, this is a great example, James, of what, what that should look like, which is you're serving, but you also are being served too. And I think that's a really, um, right. really important thing to know that if you are serving someone and you're being, um, mistreated or taken advantage of that's unacceptable. And I'll, I'll talk about that in the future, but I think you, I think you paint a great picture. And it's hard. I mean, like there are people, there are plenty of caregivers who like are caregivers for parents with dementia where it's like, 
you know, it's not whatever yeah. you're going through. It's not their fault. Like yeah. they're not there, you know? Um, and so those people have a much harder row row to hoe. But, um, but I also think that like, there's a pride, like for better or for worse, like there is a pride that comes with, uh, servitude, service and sacrifice. And like, you know, like I am deeply proud that like, I can contribute so much to taking care of this wonderful person. Cause I'm like, you know, Margo is a great person. Therefore, like the things that I can do to prop her up are like, not just a gift to her, but a gift to the world by like, mm -hmm. you know, keeping her in it, you know? Um, and I think that that can also apply to people who are caring for children or whatever, like, and you know, I'm not a parent, but like that idea of like your children are a, your gift to the world, like you're serving them, but you're also by doing a good job serving Absolutely. everyone who will ever interact with them. And so, and so I think you like, you should take pride in that. Like you should feel great. And like, um, it also doesn't hurt that other people can also see that. Um, like I'll never forget, uh, there was a time where when Margo was still able to travel via wheelchair, I remember we were at an airport um, and I was, you know, like taking her to the bathroom, like, you know, pu pushing the chair around. And I remember there was uh, like two women, like an old woman and her daughter were like standing nearby. And I remember the old woman <laughs> like looked at us and then turned to, to her daughter and very loudly was like, you see that? That's a real man. <laughs> and I like, it was funny, but it like, it did make me feel good. And I was like, you know what? That's true. Like, I think that, you know, we have these ideas of like manhood is, you know, uh, going and fighting a war or, you know, doing that sort of thing. And it's like, no, like real manhood is fucking like, helping your disabled wife to, you know, go to the bathroom or whatever. Like that's, that's its own form exactly. of strength and courage. Um, and it's like a charitable and compassionate heart. It, and look at it this way too. your wife. She also was gifted you. And if she, had, if she had met somebody else who didn't have that heart, that interestingly, when you were talking about both your parents, their hearts prepared yours for this. You know, your your mother gave so much of her life for other people who are struggling, who maybe weren't grateful for it, but she did it anyway. Your father taught you how to shoulder difficult times. So they prepared your heart for it. And so she also has, and uh, this is what I want to talk about is celebrating these, you know, these traits of the heart in men. Like you have served her and, and I, I think she's lucky to have you as well. Thanks. Well, and I will give one caution for anybody who's uh, a caregiver of any sort. Like, there is a fine line between taking pride in your service and like martyrdom. And like, and, and because it can get in your head if you're like, like, it's great to be like, one of my primary values to the world mm. is like, I am of service. Like, that's great. Uh, but it can, if it starts leading you to make, bad decisions like there was a period and this is like not the most comfortable thing to talk about but there was a period there for a long time where like i couldn't like i could not be gone i could not go anywhere i had to be home to like help her you know every day like i could only be gone for a few hours at a time because she needed lunch or whatever um and then like as she got a little bit stronger and we were able to figure out some hacks where it's like okay i can like prepare all the food and leave it for you. And like, you have enough strength to like get it out of the fridge and eat it. Like, and so like that gave me a bunch of freedom, but I was for a little while mm -hmm. there, I was afraid to use it because I like, I had based so much of my self image by that point on like, I am the guy who suffers so to make her life better. And then at some point, like in my head, like the suffering became synonymous with being a good person. And I was a little bit worried that if I didn't suffer as much, that like really the big concern was that like, I felt like all my friends saw me suffering and like gave me credit or grace or whatever for that. And I was a little bit worried that if they saw me having fun, they would sort of think like, oh, well, he's fine. And like, I was so desperate for the world or at least my friends to understand that like, no, I'm, I'm still not okay. Like I'm still, even though 
now I get 5% of the day of my life is my own to go live. Like the other 95% is still this very hard thing. Um, and it took me a little while. And like, you know, Margot very much helped me break out of it where she was like, this is stupid, right? Like you were, and, and it was pride. It was pride. And it was a fear that if I am not suffering for her, like, who am I? What is my value? And which, which is wild because for the first 30 years of my life, like, it's not like I had based my life on being a caregiver in my 20s or whatever, you know, um, but I had made such a profound shift in my head that I had to sort of uh, make peace with giving some of it up. Like, it can be a weird addiction to that, uh, to that feeling of like, oh, well, I my worth as a human comes from helping this other person because they're good. So like, it's okay if I'm like kind of a, a piece of crap or whatever, like, you know, because I'm, yeah. I'm just like in service. And it was like, no, 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 you have I to still you bring be up an interesting person. point about pride. And I think this is a word that is, has so much misconception of it being arrogance, but you've just described an excellent example of how it can manifest in different ways in martyrdom, for instance, or, you know, it's, it's, is it service? Right. You, you call it that, but is there actually something underneath it? And I think, as I've said in, in earlier episodes, the idea of whatever you place is that highest good, it, it can start twisting, you know, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm a servant, but then, it, you know, if, if it, you can turn that into something that it shouldn't be, like you said, in the case of, I, I get, I get excused for some right. of my behaviors, but it sounds over the years you've you really have placed love at the top and that keeps all things in order it keeps your service in order yeah well and i think you see this like i think more common examples are you see like you know the person who works really long hours and they're like i'm doing it for my family you know like i want them to get ahead and the family's like we just want you to be home. Like, don't say you're doing this 100%. in our name, right? Like, we don't need that money, but like you, you want this, right? Or, you know, it's possible in parenthood where, you know, you want the best for your children. And at some point you, you lose sight of what they Great actually point. need or want. And you start, you know, and, and right. Self-care is a big buzzword now, but like, it is important to recognize when, you're giving a thing that is not wanted. I, I, I genuinely hate that term because I, I think it's lost all meaning. What do you, when you think about that term in the context of our conversation, and I think it would actually be really great in the context of taking care of your wife, what does that actually mean? I mean, I do think that the idea of self-care is important. Um, like if, if the alternative is spending your time in service of others, right? Um, and so I think it is important to refill your well. For me, that really means like uh, socialization. Like I get so mm. much out of spending time with my friends. Uh, I think physical exercise is really important. I think creating art is huge for me. Like writing music, especially, you know, I'm a band guy. Like, and whether that's playing with a band or just like learn to play the drums or writing a novel or whatever, like I think that that is something that really fills the well for me. Um, so I, th those are sort of my primary things. And like, uh, I don't, I don't have a problem with self care as an idea. Um, I do think that sometimes things get yeah, talked about I so mean, much that they, the, the that reason they lose all meaning, I, that's why I wanted you to explain what you meant. Cause to me, self care has become a, a, basically an unholy cross of narcissism. It's become this right, me above right. all, uh, and it really, it really worries me. And so, yeah, I, I weirdly, there's a transition that I want to make here. This is where we're, we're kind of coming to the end, and I want yeah. to talk a bit. The reason I picked that quote at the beginning is because you recently went on a journey. Yeah. So, so oh, you, you, yeah, you, yeah, uh, it's true. Mountains. So again, the quote was, "Great things are done when men and mountains meet." And before the we started recording we were talking a little bit about this new era of your life. I can't help but feel yeah. you have some new perspective since that trip. And maybe that's, we're going to talk about going into middle age. Uh, what, what is talk a yeah, bit about that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, no, it's, 
Well, it's funny. So yeah, I, as you referenced, I recently did a backpacking trip through the Swiss Alps with um, some friends where we spent 10 days just climbing mountains every day from town to town. Um, and it's funny because that's one where uh, Margot really pushed me to do it, um, where, you know, I, I really enjoy hiking. I've gone on some smaller backpacking trips before, but when my friends were planning this and said, hey, do you want to come along? I was like, ooh, I don't know. I mean, that's being away from home for a really long time. And I was talking about this with Margo and she was like, are you an idiot? Like this is, do you ever want to see the Alps in your life? If so, there is never yeah. going to be a better experience. Like they've planned it all out. All you got to do is buy a ticket and pack your pack. Like if you want this, go, we'll figure it out. And we did like, uh, you know, we've got roommates and uh, her sister and her parents that all like stepped up to That's really fantastic. help out Margot while I was gone. Um, and that was, that's an example of really like making sure you're not sacrificing unnecessarily because she wanted me to have this, you know, it's very important to her for me as her partner to like live my, the fullest life I can. Like, obviously she needs my help, but she also like, she wants to live vicariously through me and she wants to see me happy. She wants to like, you know, it's very important to her that like, if that, as she's put it, you know, the illness has already taken her life. She doesn't want it to take two lives, you know? And I think that's really an incredible perspective for somebody in her position. But, um, but yeah, but no, actually in the last, that was uh, in some ways a culmination of a few years ago, deep in the pandemic, uh, I realized that, I needed to make some sort of change in my life in order to choose joy because I feel like for most of my life, uh, joy had just sort of found me. Like it had just kept falling in my lap. Like I would, you know, got to have all these incredible experiences because I had friends that were really fun and I was playing music and I was, you know, writing and succeeding in my career and just like joy always kind of found me. And then, you know, after many years of caretaking and you know, being so cut off from everybody, because of course, with my wife being so at risk, like we have had to and still have to can quarantine much harder than most people. Um, and I was just, uh, I was just depressed for the first time in my life. And I realized I needed to actively choose joy, whatever that meant. And so that meant, that's meant a lot of like trying to go on more trips and figuring out ways like, how can I safely, you know, continue to serve Margot while also playing with a band or whatever, you know, like when, when can I make decisions where it's like, okay, I'm going to go do this thing that I wouldn't normally be able to do. How can I make it possible? Um, but yeah, so, uh, sorry, I've totally the, gotten the off track of the original was, question. You took this, this trip and you, you came back and I yeah. feel, yeah, that you've, come back with new perspective and maybe looking towards you're turning 40 soon, uh, what, what that looks like the middle age and, and, and maybe how you see after that experience of getting away and experiencing joy, meeting the mountain, so to speak, what, what you came back with. Yeah. Oh yeah. It's funny. Cause when you originally read that quote at the beginning, um, about like when you meet a mountain, great things happen. Um, Interestingly, I, I hadn't made the connection to my mountain climbing trip at all. I thought you were talking mm -hmm. about the mountain of Margot's illness and the fact that, like, I do think great things have happened from me having to be in that role because, like, I'm so much prouder of the person that I am now because I've served and because I've sacrificed than if I'd just, you know, if I'd gotten lucky enough to just write a bunch of books and, like, play a bunch of music or whatever, like... Those are very, um, they're gratifying, but they're mm. much uh, shallower pleasures. Like they're, they're ego strokes. They're not like, oh, wow, I made a difference, you know? Um, and so it's a deep, different form of satisfaction. So, yeah, I mean, I guess going forward, um, that said, I'm really committed to giving myself more of those fun, like, uh, you know, creative, um, create artistic creation pleasures. Um, but still continuing to just lean into being, being a good friend, being a good partner. Like those are the things that really matter to me. Um, you know, I, I often tell people this, like, uh, like I had a realization after my second novel came out where I was like, 
if I write two books or 200, like I'm still going to die. And like when I die, I don't care. Like all my books could vanish. Like I'm not doing this for some sort of like legacy. Mm -hmm. I'm doing it because it's fun. And so like if writing books stops being fun or is getting in the way of like the life I want to live, then like prioritize accordingly. It's so easy in creative industries to be like, I have to grind. I have to pursue the goal. And like, stop and ask yourself why stop and ask yourself like is it necessary and if it is is it necessary in the way that you're doing it because like you know when i stopped berating myself and like forcing myself to write i you know i still wrote probably 90 percent as much but i was able to truly enjoy the time that i was not writing you know that kind of thing and so uh i think just trying to be really intentional with how i spend my time and like saying yes to the things that bring me joy and letting the things that don't advice. go. What, what does legacy mean to you and what do you hope your legacy is James? Yeah. I mean, I don't, I think that legacy is all about the impact you make on the people around you. Um, and you know, that can be artistic, but I think it's much easier to make an impact by just being a good friend being a good partner, being a member of your community. Like, I mean, frankly, the the realities of publishing in almost every sort is that like your work is forgotten almost instantly. Like it'll be forgotten while you're still alive, certainly after you're dead. But like the the marks you make in the lives of the people around you, like if you uh, are a good role model or a caregiver or friend to a child, then like, after you're gone, they're still going to carry that, like that piece of you with them. And so I think that really other people are how you make a mark in the world. Um, and, you know, there's also uh, that comes back to like, um, I knew you were going to ask about advice. And so I was thinking about this beforehand, but uh, I realized when I was in my early 20s that I had been so focused on achievement and accolades and building my resume, building my be belt notches where it's like, well, I published this and I got published over here and like my band headlined this venue and like all those sort of marks of achievement. Um, and then one day I realized that like my friends, my actual friends didn't care about any of that. Like that was not why they liked me. And so it's like, why was I spending all this time focused on that? Like, the things that made people like me was how I treated them. Um, and it just totally shifted my perspective of what it means to live a good life. And like, for me, that means making and maintaining a lot of really strong relationships where I do show care for people and where I can have and, and receive it in return. Um, and I just think I became such a better person once it stopped being about like, let's acquire as many bragging rights as possible. And instead let's like get really deep with people. I love being the sort of person who, you know, you meet at a work event and 20 minutes later, you're talking about their divorce or whatever. Like I, I love that. I want to, uh, I want to reach people where their heart is at, not just at the surface yeah. level. I think that's a, an excellent answer to both shared wisdom for maybe a younger generation. Um, and about legacy, because I think that's really a question yeah. that we should all be answering, even at younger ages. And maybe that's where some of this bit of meaningless comes from. Like, we're not thinking about legacy. We're thinking about the yeah. things that only last here in this brief time that we have on earth without asking, how does it carry on kind mm -hmm. of eternally? And what you talked about is it's a matter of the heart, yeah. right? Well, and it's so easy to build meaning. Like I, uh, I said this online the other day, um, a, a piece of advice where, because you do get so much advice from like where we started this conversation, the sort of the to toxic masculinity uh, culture, like the alpha culture where it's all about like, you know, you got to get ripped and you got to get money and you got to be dominant to all these things. Um, and they always ignore the easiest life hack for like making people like you. And the answer mm -hmm. is to like people like to, and specifically to ask people questions and then really listen to and care about their answers. Like 
it's so easy. It's so simple. And it works in every situation. Like it makes your boss likes you. It makes your employees feel heard. It's super charming in romantic situations. It's, it extends your friendships and like deepens them. But like, it really is that simple. Like ask and then pay attention. Um, I mean, it's also, I mean, frankly, uh, there's also a, uh, a Mary Oliver poem that I don't remember the whole thing, but I know that one of her instructions in it is just pay attention, Mm. be astonished. And I feel like if you apply that to the people around you, if you can just listen to them, get, get to know them intimately and then just like, not just be amazed, but like, let them know that you're amazed by them. Like life gets so rich so that's a uh, that's my bit of uh, masculinity well, influencer advice. I think I think it's <laughs> ask questions and I think listen. It's beautiful, and I can see just in the, the, all the years that I've known you, what you've put as a goal is to be joyful. That is a word that I would definitely use to describe you, and I can see mm, I can see that. Thank you. And I hope anyone listening can hear that, even in deep struggle and suffering there is still joy to be found. And James, you're, you're an amazing representation of that. And I, I'm really glad that we're friends. Yeah, well, thanks, we should, dude. You too. I don't, I, we can't do better than that. I don't think. <laughs> yeah, we might as well, uh, might as James, well wrap it there. Thank you so much. And uh, again, I call out to anyone that if you felt this moved your heart or you have a story you want to share, I'm, I'm here to listen. As James said, I want to be astonished by you. So I look forward to hearing from you all. Uh, Thank you for tuning in. God bless.